Thank you. Please sit down. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Ambassador, thanks for putting together a crowd for us. I appreciate it. <laughs> Folks, I'm uh, delighted to be here and uh, happy to be back with so many distinguished people, and I mean that sincerely. Many of you uh, know as much or more about the subject I'm going to speak to than I do, including, uh, is Elizabeth Blackburn here? Elizabeth, a Nobel laureate uh, who uh, uh, found the, the BRCA gene. Uh, she, can, as they all Jane goes, she's forgotten more about this than I'm going to know. But, uh, but uh, folks, um, uh, I'm happy to be back here at the World Economic Forum at Davos to talk about the fight against cancer. And I'm accompanied by Greg Simon, who is the executive director of the administration's Cancer Moonshot, and who will lead uh, my Biden Cancer Initiative when I uh, launch after we leave office, which is in about 48 hours. Um, <laughs> I hope I have a ride home. Um, I'll talk about it in a few moments. But um, Greg, where are you? Uh, uh, Greg has had a great deal of experience in this area, and he's led the initiative uh, the last year for the president and me. Uh, last year, I arrived at the forum a few days after President Obama delivered uh, his final State of the Union address, and uh, where he announced, uh, quite frankly to my surprise, that he was putting me in charge of a national cancer moonshot to double the rate of progress in, uh, in preventing, and diagnosing, and treating cancer. And uh, I was not only generally surprised by the announcement, I was generally surprised by the response that I got both at home and abroad. Uh, here at Davos, I was scheduled, uh, Klaus had asked me to deliver the keynote address on the promise and perils of the fourth industrial revolution and uh, to participate in a few bilateral meetings over, uh, over the remaining days. But given the overwhelming interest in the cancer moonshot, the forum asked me if I could uh, quickly convene a, a round table of cancer experts, among who Dr. Elizabeth was one of them, uh, to discuss uh, where we are and where we need to go in the fight against cancer. And so I did in a few days' notice, uh, we put together such a round table, and it kicked off uh, what for me was a year-long journey uh, that's taken me literally around the world meeting with, breast, uh, with uh, the best cancer researchers, doctors, uh, um, and uh, uh, patients, as well as philanthropists, uh, heads of state, uh, they've all been part of it. But I'm back here today to outline uh, how far we've come uh, and uh, what, uh, at least from our perspective, uh, what path we should chart moving forward. And let me start with where we believe we are. Uh, when we announced the cancer moonshot, I knew there would be a lot of skeptics out there and said, well, here we go again. Uh, haven't we done this before? President Nixon, when he declared war on cancer in 1971, uh, um, he was earnest and sincere and very committed. But what makes the difference between then and now is uh, the single big difference is that he had no army. He had no resources. He had no weapons. He had no strategy to win. But after 45 years, with many of you in this room doing incredible work, 45 years of progress, after decades of funding research, uh, training scientists and physicians, treating millions of patients, uh, we now have an army. Uh, we now have powerful new technologies and tools like immunotherapy that, by the way, even six, eight, ten years ago was viewed kind of as a voodoo science out there. It wasn't really an integral part of this fight that uh, makes cancer cells visible to the immune system so our Natural defenses can destroy the cancer. Surgeons are using cutting edge robotics to allow for far more precise imaging to find the cancer and more precisely surgically remove uh, the cancer in hard to reach areas. Liquid biopsies that find early signs of cancer in the blood and tell you whether or not you have a particular cancer. These advances and many other provide uh, hope that a more precise medicines and diagnostics might greatly improve uh, and detect and defeat cancer. But on so many levels, we've now reached uh, an inflection point. When the system was set up before, we thought there was basically only one cancer uh, in different parts of the body. We've now learned there are over 200 specific kinds of cancers. After decades, uh, 
we thought we could uh, tackle cancer one discipline at a time. But that's not how cancer operates. Cancer uses every tool at its disposal. It hides the immune system. It builds its own blood supply system. It uses viruses to spread. It engineers a, a friendlier environment, a cellular environment in which to survive. And it knows how to spread through the body using pathways and mutations that, that, uh, that, that we, uh, we don't fully understand yet. And cancer never gives up. It, it never surrenders. That's why we have to use every discipline uh, uh, cancer does. Uh, in, uh, in, and that's what we're starting to do in a way that's only really begun in the last five or six, seven years. Five years ago, as I said, oncologists weren't routinely uh, working closely with immunologists, virologists, geneticists, uh, um, chemical and biological engineers. And now they are. Immunotherapies are finding the keys to making cancer cells visible and targeting them. Virologists are now working on vaccines to prevent and treat cancers. Geneticists are cataloging mutations that, uh, that, that drive cancers. And chemical and biological engineers are helping engineer environments hostile to cancer. And they're all working together. You know, like many of you, uh, uh, I decided to become acquainted with this after, uh, after someone close to me and my family was diagnosed. You tend to try to learn everything you possibly can once that occurs. And uh, I knew little about the discipline. Uh, and uh, like I said, what impressed me was that so much of this is really very brand new um, in terms of the collaboration. Also, there's recognition that by aggregating and sharing millions of patients' data like genomics, family history, lifestyles, treatment outcomes, and by using supercomputing power that we can do now a million billion calculations per second, we can understand why one therapy uh, or treatment works for one person and not for another for the same exact cancer. And today, uh, it was just announced that two major data sharing organizations who were part of the roundtable, five of them were here when we had the roundtable uh, last year, two of them, Cancer Link and, uh, and another that, uh, that, uh, that focuses on genomic information called Project Genie, are joining forces to accelerate data sharing and Five groups. Washington, privately, and they came to my office uh, for an hour and a half. And I asked each of them to explain to me, help educate me as to what they were doing. And I remember when we finished saying something that will not surprise you all, but as you said, didn't you know that, Joe? I looked and said, but it sounds like you're all doing the same thing. No, I'm not being facetious. I said, you've all just made the case to me, the more data you can aggregate across the spectrum, the more likely you are to find patterns, the more likely you are to find cures and or treatments. Why aren't you talking to one another? And I remember afterwards, uh, several of them walking up to me as we were having coffee and pulling me aside and say, keep this up, keep this up. But I didn't do it. I had nothing to do with this, this sharing and collaboration. But the point is, the mood is changing as I felt it, feel it just in the last year. I also learned from the best minds in the world that the strategy we've been following is equivalent to fighting the last war. The model of scientific breakthroughs for most of the history <coughs> was one of individual achievement. Jonas Salt in the, in the laboratory, finding, finding the, uh, creating the polio vaccine. There was little, if any, sharing among hospitals and researchers, and little ability to share even if they wanted to share. And across the world, our, uh, our funding processes and systems and academic research primarily follow that old model. So the moonshot has fundament fundamentally been about two things since I began it. And uh, the first objective I've had was to inject the urgency of now into this fight and double the rate of progress and do it in five years instead of 10. And when I say urgency of now, the brightest minds I've met in the world, and I've been doing my job and mostly working on, on, uh, on strategic doctrine and foreign policy my career, 
the brightest people I've met. I've met now and spoken with over 13,000 cancer researchers in the two major organizations. I've met with scores and scores of, of leaders in the field. I've met with seven or eight uh, Nobel laureates in the field. And, um, uh, and the amazing thing to me is that uh, they're all working so hard. But uh, with a few changes, even without learning more information, we could probably extend the life of a lot of people. You know, uh, the one thing that the clinicians can tell you is, and those of you who are clinicians, how many times you had a patient say to you, doctor, can you just, I know you can't save me, but can you just give me two more weeks so I can watch her get married, doc? Doc, doc, can you just, can you just, can you just keep me around for another month so I can see my first grandchild born, doc? Doc, I'm not asking for anything except can you just extend it a little bit? I might be able to get my finances in order. You hear that all the time. I heard that at my son's bedside. He wasn't afraid of dying, but he wanted to settle a few things. Greater collaboration with no new breakthroughs can have the possibility of being able to say to one in four or five of those patients, yeah, I can figure a way just a little longer. The second thing, the objective I had, was changing the culture, coming up with a new strategy for this fight, not for the strategy for the last fight. We have four primary structures for organizing the moonshot. One, we established the White House Cancer Moonshot Task Force to reimagine the federal government's fight and role in this fight, to break down silos in the federal government. To, I went all over the world, literally, asking for suggestions of what should we be doing better. Under this task force, which I engaged and Greg met with members of each of the departments at least once every two weeks for updates on progress that was being made on things we were trying to do. We engaged everyone in the, from the National Institute of Health to the Defense Department, to, veteran, and to Veterans Affairs, but to some agencies never been involved, NASA. Everybody would know, why in the hell are you bringing NASA into this? Or the Patent Office, or the Environmental Protection Agency, or the White House Policy Councils, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, the Office of Management and Budget. They all have a role to play. Secondly, we hosted a Cancer Moonshot Summit in June. Some of you participated in that summit. We held it in D.C. where 400 of you came. We had roundtables on various aspects of de dealing with cancer. Some of you were there, made significant contributions. But interestingly enough, we simulcast, in effect, these roundtables where 7,000 people around the country gathered in 300 local summits held in every single state, including Guam and Puerto Rico, to try to again inject this notion of the urgency of now. And the summit workshops launched a torrent of new collaborations and innovative initiatives across all sectors. And they continue to this day. For example, we got a call from IBM. How'd you like to borrow Watson? They came to us and offered Watson, their supercomputer, to partner with the largest hospital in the world, the Department of Defense and the Veterans Affairs. So now a veteran can get her genome or tumor sequenced at Walter Reed, and they're very good at it, and they can do it quickly. And then Watson will search all specific therapies that would target that particular cancer and provide recommendations to physicians and tumor boards to use in choosing the right therapy. So you increase the prospect that the first time out will be the best shot out. In June, I was at the University of Chicago where, I, where we launched the National Cancer Institute Genomic Data Commons. The purpose was to bring together cancer sequencing data and related patient information uh, from the Cancer Genome Atlas. Well, that atlas comprised 14,000 individuals with that data. Now, the database has grown now to over 30,000 individuals, and our international agreements are going to add tens of thousands of more patients' data. 
And Amazon came along and says, look, we'll agree to make their cloud computing available to help us store this enormous amounts of data that this project is going to generate. But the important thing is that it's totally open access database, able to be accessed by any research in the world, eliminating silos. It did not exist a year ago. And this data has already been accessed and used by more than, more than 5 million times. And this was in the, the, the spring of last year. Increasing chances exponentially that we may find some answers. We also transformed access to cancer clinical trials. In the United States, only 4% of the people diagnosed with cancer ever become part of a clinical trial, which is how research advances and how, and maybe the only possibility of saving the patient's life, maybe. So we engaged the President's Innovation Fellows, some of the top young technology minds in the world, mostly from Silicon Valley, who've dedicated a year to come in. These are trying to modernize the whole government. So I went to them and said, look, there's no way anyone can rationally go and figure out that, 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 that oncologist from Bemidji, Minnesota, who's come up with an actual, actual, accurate diagnosis, doesn't know where to turn. He's not near on one of the great cancer centers in the United States. So where did they go? There was a site that said you could click on and find out where there are cancer trials, but it was useless. So these brilliant young they range in age from 25 to 40 thereabouts. Within three weeks, put together a site. They can go now. It's trials.cancer.gov. Type in real words like breast cancer, leukemia, zip codes, age, and then find a list of clinical trials near you or your loved one that previously you could not have easily found. And I find the people equally excited about this are the pharmaceutical companies. They have trouble finding enough people for their trials. You and your doctor can now find out what trials are available and what can, for what types of cancer near you. Another example is NASA, I mentioned earlier. Working with the National Cancer Institute, establishing a new collaboration to study the biological effects of particle beam radio or, excuse me, radiotherapy and uh, a novel technology that may deliver more targeted doses of radiation to tumor cells. The Center for Disease Controls and Prevention is advancing the effort to promote cancer vaccines like HPV vaccine that are safe and effective strategies for combating viruses uh, for types of various types of cancer. The Moonshot also is initiated the Blood Profiling Atlas pilot. Uh, representatives from the government, academia, pharmaceutical, diagnostic companies are launching partnerships to create an open database for liquid biopsies to accelerate the development of safe and effective blood profiling diagnostic technologies, and, and patients are, patient will benefit from this. Stanford Medicine and the VA in Palo Alto are collaborating to establish the, the Haddon uh, Center at Palo Alto uh, California, for the potential benefit of both veterans and non-veteran cancer patients. The Haddon Center will utilize particle beam radiotherapy using beams uh, uh, of charged particles such as proton and helium, carbon, or other ions to allow more precise targeting everywhere inside the patient's body, potentially, potentially, we don't know yet, resulting in less damage to, uh, to healthy cells. The reason NASA got in the game is they know more about radiation than anybody in the world. So they're participating. Earlier this year, we announced uh, what we call the NCI, the National Cancer Institute Formulary. This is a public-private partnership with more than two dozen pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies, uh, which allows researchers to uh, test existing drugs for new, com new combinations that could be effective against different types of cancer. That's how, this is how it works. When you go into the bar and you listen to a song and you put money in a jukebox, you don't have to negotiate a licensing agreement with each song uh, from the record company you're about to play. That license agreement has already been worked out. But until recently, if you waited to use, you've wanted to use a combination of drugs, you had to go through each company, get permission to use each different drug. It literally could take years. A lot of people got lost in the meantime that might have been saved. Now the NCI has already worked out the details of intellectual property, access, and licensing. 
So researchers and companies know there is an agreement on licensing if the drug is successful and how the intellectual property will be shared. This new system just got launched and I urge as many of you as possible to join it, participate and share. It will make an enormous difference potentially. Combination drugs have the potential to do for cancers what, uh, what many of you have done for HIV. There is total collaboration in HIV. There are dozens of other actions that you can read about in whitehouse.gov slash cancer moonshot. The third thing we did was we uh, created a cancer moonshot blue ribbon panel for our, our National Institute of, to, uh, to recommend research that holds the most promise for additional investments. Some of you were named to that panel. My dad used to have an expression. He said, Joe, if everything's equally important to you, nothing's important to you. What do the best minds in the world think are the best therapies or technology we, sh we should be pursuing as rapidly as we can? In what order? That Blue Room panel delivered a report with transformative recommendations to change the research blueprint for the National Cancer Institute. For example, launching a 3D cancer atlas. Oncologists today rely on past experience, consultation with, with multidisciplinary teams, published studies, and other sources to make diagnosis and treatment decisions. But providing a web-based catalog of genetic lesions and cellular interactions in a tumor, immune and other cells uh, in the tumor, uh, the microenvironment, one that maps the evolution of the tumor from development to uh, to uh, metastases, it's going to enable researchers to develop predictive models for tumor uh, progression and uh, in response to treatment that will ultimately help oncologists make informed treatment decisions for each patient. Mm -hmm. Now, none of this is a guaranteed promise, but all hold significant potential. Establishing a national network of cancer patients that with appropriate privacy safeguards will provide them a genetic profile of their own cancer and let them pre-register for clinical trials so they can, be, uh, they, they, they can be contacted when a trial in which they may be eligible opens. Establishing uh, clinical trial networks devoted exclusively to immunotherapies for pediatric and adult cancers would advance research uh, in this area and could lead to new vaccines to prevent cancers uh, of all types in children as well as adults. Expanding the use of proven cancer prevention and early uh, detection strategies. Several cancer prevention and risk reduction strategies have proven to be highly effective, including tobacco control, colorectal cancer screening, HPV vaccine, boosting prevention research to identify ways to increase uh, the uptake of these strategies, especially in medically underserved populations, could greatly reduce the incidence and death from lung and other tobacco-related cancers, colorectal cancer, cervical and other HPV-related cancers, res uh, respectively. Here's why it matters. By some estimates, at least 50% of the cancers can be prevented, and that prevention falls into three major categories. One, personal actions on the part of the individuals, such as living a healthier lifestyle, avoiding cancer risk behaviors like smoking. Second way of prevention is responsibilities of government and industry to reduce carcinogenic and toxins in the air we breathe, the water we drink, the soil we grow our food in. And the third is to make available existing diagnostic tools to all communities because we know the earlier cancer is detected, the better prospect for an outcome. That's good. But there is a, a fourth outcome, an entirely new set of diagnostic tools that can detect, can detect cancers earlier, new technologies like hereditary markers, instead of waiting until you're 48 years old to get your first colonoscopy. If they have the marker, get it when you're 16 years old. And by continuing to keep an eye on it, prevent you from being the victim of dying of cancer, of that cancer. The fourth, and in addition to the task force report, um, I was asked to deliver a report to the president in October that included the progress made in 16 and my assessment, and it's only mine, uh, uh, of what the road ahead looks like. Obviously, I would like you all to look at that and criticize it, critique it. 
report lays out the changes we need, in our view, to implement uh, our to, to, to implement at our research institutions, universities, to align our research system with the realities and opportunities of the 21st century, and all this has helped us make progress on the international fight against cancer. Last April, I delivered remarks at the Conference on Regenerative Medicine hosted by the Vatican and that the Pope addressed as well. I laid out what I thought to be the guidepost for international collaboration through the moonshot. One, focus on prevention, access, and affordability around the world. Two, raise the urgency of international response to cancer, reflecting the same urgency we bring to infectious disease threats. There are 16 million people who will die from cancer this year. And according to many of the experts in the audience, if we don't do anything about it, there will be 26 million dying by 2020. Increased research and in patient data sharing among researchers, institutions, foundations, and nations. Support standardization of data and uh, uh, biorepositories. Increase government investment in cancer research. We should increase it to capitalize in this moment of this inflection point. Since then, the United States has signed 10 memorandum of understanding in nine countries. I'm supposedly an expert on foreign policy, an expert anywhere from out of town with a briefcase. <laughs> I have traveled over 1,300,000 miles for the president, meeting with heads of state that I've, most of whom I've known most of my career. I was recently in, uh, um, in the Gulf, the Persian Gulf, recently, seven months ago, talking about the fight against ISIS with the, with the head of state. Sitting on the Gulf, the Persian Gulf, talking to him. He had his people lined up on one side of a table outside, and I had mine for a dinner. And before we began, he said, Mr. Vice President, before we talk about ISIS, or they call it DASH, before we talk about DASH, can we talk about cancer? We want to help. And that tour through the Middle East, in Jordan and Israel, can we talk about cancer? President put together, and 50 heads of state came in the East Room with rectangular tables lined up around the entire room with 50 heads of state on how to deal with the nuclear proliferation. The president sat on in front of the fireplace, and I was my, directly across from my back to that famous uh, hallway. Before he began, he said, I know a lot of you want to talk to Joe about cancer, but let's deal with the nuclear issue first. <laughs> he, he, he wasn't being facetious. The result, whether I was in Melbourne, Japan, the UAE, we've signed, sought, we we're sought after and, and signed 10 detailed memorandum of understanding as to how we should jointly proceed. These have focused on data sharing and advanced research. Last month, we saw the United States Congress come together. I know I'm supposedly um, the guy that Republicans and Democrats like in the Congress. Uh, I actually respect the Congress. That's part of the problem uh, that people think I have, but I generally do. And we couldn't get anything through the Congress. But uh, through the leadership of some Republicans in the House and Democrats in the Senate, they put together what they call the 21st Century Cures Act. And no one thought we could pass it. At the very waning hours, we were able to go up and get them jointly to appropriate and commit to $6.3 billion in biomedical and health-related research, including $1.8 billion for the National Cancer Institute to invest in additional research as part of the moonshot. This is the one bipartisan thing that exists and I pray will continue to exist in the new administration. But it also is an international consensus. So we have enormous opportunities, I believe, with greater collaboration, but organizing a different pathway than we've been following. This investment, in my view, should be matched by other nations who agree that now is the time to double down on our fight against cancer. And it's my hope, as I've already spoken to the vice president-elect, who's a good man, about to come in to uh, be vice president in four days or three days, 
about my willingness to continue to work with him and the incoming administration to be committed and enthusiastic as we are the goal of ending cancer as we know it, and my prayer is they will do that as well. But I know those in the private sector, philanthropy, at academic institutions and nonprofit organizations are continuing to work regardless of what the next administration does. There's too much momentum here. And this will include me as a private citizen. I do not have, I hope I'm well informed, but I don't have the expertise most of you have. But I found I have the power to convene, and uh, thus far I've been viewed as a, uh, um, a fair, fair dealer. I have no interest in any one institution or another. And uh, I maybe even have the ability to occasionally shame so people move in directions that up to now there's been unwillingness to move because of the culture that's developed. After I leave office, after meeting with some very significant people who many of you know, a couple in this room as well, have encouraged me to uh, set up the Biden Cancer Initiative with similar goals of the moonshot. Changing the way we do business in cancer research and development and providing, and providing cancer care. The initiative will focus on, one, improving data standards and giving patients a mechanism to share their data so they can help many other patients going through the same fight. And so researchers can use the data to find new patients and new cures. Most people are not experts like you. They think that already exists, that patients actually own their own data. The people, they actually have access to their own data. I was with one particular researcher and he said, well, we're having trouble getting patients. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll make you bet. The press was with me, like here. I said, I bet if I ask them, their networks will give me 15 minutes of prime time to talk about this. I said, if I pick one single repository, I'll bet you I get minimum between two and 10 million patients who the next morning will give you their data, say they'll send it there. And this researcher said, well, yeah, maybe I have a, maybe I have a point. We have, yeah. Guys, this is not, this is within our wheelhouse. That's the easy part. The hard part is what you all do. Working with community care organizations to help improve access of care and quality of care is another focus that we'll have. So outcomes aren't wholly dictated by your zip code. And convening a national conversation with pharmaceutical companies, insurers, biotech companies, and others to ensure patients can afford treatments. Too many Americans are forced to sell their homes, go into bankruptcy just so a loved one can get the care and hope for the cure has need to change. And these companies need to have serious remuneration. They're taking real risks. But there's got to be a way we can figure this out. And also calling for greater transparency and access to clinical trials so more, person, more patients can get access to treatments that might work for their cancer. And continuing to work for a cultural change and improvements in our cancer research system. So we make the best use of today's opportunity to generate and share data and knowledge from patients and researchers to help patients everywhere around the world. These are the reasons why I plan on staying involved. Because uh, for the first time in 45 years, there's some real movement toward collaboration. Not because people are selfish, but because it wasn't the model. It's not the way it worked for good reason. But the collaboration between cancer centers, drug companies, insurance industry, and government is where the solution lies and how we'll end cancer as we know it. So let me conclude by saying, which will not shock you, I'm optimistic. I know I'm always optimistic, but I'm optimistic because of the absolute commitment and sheer brilliance I've been exposed to from so many researchers and scientists and, and these inst great institutions. You know, I see the day when patients get the right therapy the first time for their cancer, where prevention is more effective and where care is personalized and more effective with less harmful side effects. I see the day when those younger people of you in this room when you take your children and grandchildren later for their school physical, 
that they will, at the time they get their vaccination against measles and mumps, they'll be vaccinated against certain types of cancer, like you can be vaccinated against HPV virus. I see the day when we'll be able to identify through markers in the blood cancers that haven't even developed yet. And the one thing I can tell you, there's hope. I'm willing to bet everyone in this room who's had cancer or has had a loved one who's had cancer, you understand that feeling when the doctor says it's cancer. You all know at that moment, the one thing you most need is some reason to hope. When President Kennedy discussed discuss sending humankind to the moon, he talked about the commitment the nation, and this is the phrase used, the commitment the nation was unwilling to postpone. A very famous speech, and some of you can probably recite the speech, but the part of the speech since I've been a kid that got me the most about my notion about governance, my notion about exploration, my notion about science, it was a nation or a people are unwilling to postpone. We should be unwilling to postpone finding the answer to how to end cancer as we know it. And uh, I'm confident we can do it. You're already doing it, and, uh, but let's double down. It is about the urgency now. I thank you all for your graciousness and listening, and uh, thank you for having me back. <laughs>